Jeb Corliss. Welcome hey. to Unfair Fight. How's it going, man? It's nice to see you. Yeah, heck yeah. I'm, uh, and I read your book. For those that don't know, it is called Memoirs from the Edge. <laughs> I, do, I told you before we started, dude, I don't read a lot of books. Like, I just don't have time. <laughs> I work so damn much, but I love reading. And I read this, what was it, 300 some pages? Well, it's 180,000 words, so that's amazing if you read that in one night. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't stop first off. Uh, oh. And, you know, just to give you an intro, I'm going to read a little bit of an excerpt on the back of it just to tee it up, and I'd love to get into your life story. I mean, talk about a story of, of uh, resilience. I don't know any other <laughs> word other than resilience and <laughs> well, wild you. resilience. How about that? But uh, here we go. Jeb Corliss, one of the most iconic base jumpers and wingsuit pilots of our time. In his autobiography, is an odyssey in the madness. Uh, Corliss breaks and rebuilds him, uh, self-time and again. Learning what only pain and daring can teach, the tales he brings back offers insight into the darkness that exists within the mind, as well as uh, his own unique way of coping. Many grapple with mental illness in one way or another, and Corliss gives a glaringly clear view of his struggle while traversing the world's most dangerous sports. And the reason, and I was so excited to have you come on, you know, a lot of our world, it's it's entrepreneurs, it's people starting businesses, and you know the vast majority of them fail. And so, well, maybe the physical pain and extreme and everything that's going on, there's a lot of deep mental wars you're always having oh, with yourself and motivation. Terrifying. That's a terrifying uh, thing to do to start a business. My God, as you as you work through it. And so, I thought, you know, part of this podcast, we love having folks on that have fought through adversity and then reached the absolute pointy tip of execution and profession, which yeah. you clearly have. I and mean, I had uh, George St. Pierre, the UFC fighter oh, on, yeah. I don't know, a, a year ago, another, another just amazing story. So oh, he's yes, man, I would love to get into your story. So I was reading your book and it opens up with a story of your mother while you're still in her womb <laughs> at eight months pregnant. <laughs> Trying to hike to 18,000 feet to see a glacier or something in Nepal. Everest Base I think Camp. Was. She was on her way to Everest Base Camp. Yeah. I mean, that might be the best tee into the rest of your story ever because it sounds <laughs> a little bit genetic. <laughs> but well, this, this is the funny thing is a lot of people ask me, like, oh, what does your mother think of, you know, what you do? And I'm always like, yeah. well, she's 10 times crazier than I am. I mean, <laughs> the stuff that she did is, is mind boggling. And I couldn't even right. imagine taking three children to Nepal and India for, you know, a year when you are basically broke, don't own a home, don't own a car, have nothing. And you decide, oh, I'm just going to take the kids and, and $50,000 of cash, which is all I have on the planet. And let's go spend Full a year send. traveling through India. It's like, who, what kind of crazy person would do that with a one-year-old, a five-year-old and an eight-year-old? I, I just it's, boggles my mind. I mean, so my it, mom was very yeah. hardcore and, and I did come from somewhere, which she's where I came from. Well, well, tell us about that. Like, walk us through kind of your childhood. You live in a lot of different places and went through a lot of experience. I'd love to learn, you know, more about Jeb and what formed you into one of the most, if not the elite base <laughs> jump and wingsuit, uh, you know, action sports. Well, it, it, uh, it's funny because, you know, um, my book, like I said, you, you know, you read 180,000 words, which is a lot. <laughs> Um, and my childhood is complex. Like it's a, and, and I had to kind of like, it's very condensed in the book because there's sure. just so much. Um, but I tried to get into just un getting people to understand that I've been traveling since I was born at one year old. I was in Afghanistan with my parents, you know, as the Russians were basically about to invade. So that gives you kind of an idea of how my life started. My life started with an already, um, kind of adventurous spirit, you know, and my sure. parents were very adventurous and they loved traveling and they were art dealers. So they would buy art in foreign countries, bring it back to the States, sell it. That's my grandparents, solid. my grandfather was obviously in World War II, but after he got out of World War II, he started a travel business where he took people on safari through Africa and down, you know, rivers in the Grand Canyon. And this was back in like the late forties, early fifties. So it, it, this kind of travel bug and adventurous spirit is right. definitely built into my DNA. That's part of it. Um, but I obviously went into a, a, a different kind of place with it. And right. my childhood had a big impact. I mean, when I was five years old, I had my first near-death experience. I was in New Delhi, India, and I got um, amoebic dysentery. And oh by the time gosh. my parents got me to a doctor, the doctor told my parents straight up, he's going to die. Like, 
there's nothing we can do. So that up. was that was most of the time then a, a, oh, yeah. a fatal. Oh, super wow. fatal, especially for children. I lost over a third of my body weight. I it, for oh. children it was very, um, especially in India, like they don't have the type of medicine we have here. So the first doctor told my parents I was dead. <clears> like there's nothing he can do. They didn't take that. They're like, yeah, well, there's got to be someone else. <laughs> you know, there's like, right. like we're getting a second opinion on that one. Right. Like, we're not just going right. to take that. So they took me to another doctor more western and this doctor was like uh it's bad you know really bad but we'll see what we can do and i didn't die but what's fascinating is i went through hallucinations i mean serious stuff happened to me like mentally because of wow. that and i remember after the fact something strange which was i understood death at a very early age so, as so it actually, it hit you. That, oh, oh I knew. Five. Oh, yeah. I, I, I knew I was going to die. And I knew that there was nothing that I could do to stop it from coming. Death was going to take me. And I knew that at five, six years old. So oh, ha- coming to this kind of realization yeah. that death was coming for me and there was nothing I could do to stop it from taking me really shifted my perspective and how I treated my own life and how I – the things that I started becoming fascinated and started doing. So I really got into – I got into – fear like fear became really interesting to me because of the the way it made me feel right so as a as the same trip where i got amoebic dysentery i also saw um cobras for my first time so i write a story in my book about the first time i i saw a snake and i remember them opening the the the, they had this huge basket like that launched lots of baskets and each one had a snake in it but the big basket was a giant king cobra and they opened it up, and I remember the king cobra coming out, and it's spreading its hood. And I remember seeing it and being absolutely terrified. And I remember thinking, even as a little kid, I was like, why does this thing fright? Why do I feel this way? Like, why is it making me feel this? I didn't understand. I'd never seen a snake before. There was right. no reason for me to be scared of it. <laughs> so your first was, one was a cobra? Yeah. I mean, but I was just kind of like, <laughs> Totally <"Why?"> normal. <laughs> but, it, but again, how do I know it's scary? Like, right. why do, how would I even know this thing's dangerous? I'm a little kid. No one's explained to me that this thing's dangerous. So right. all of a sudden, I just have a natural, like, fear of this creature, and I wanted to understand why. And then I became fascinated with that feeling, like, the fascinated with why things made me feel this way. So I started, when I got home at six years old, I started catching snakes. And that became, like, a very, um, that, I was obsessed. And I, and I always became very obsessed with things. And so I started with, you know, little snakes. Like I started with gardens, garter snakes. Right. And I, right. catch, I catch bull snakes for like my next level. And I started catching all these species that got closer and more aggressive and bigger and more dangerous. But none of them had venom. But they still right. bite you. Like, like a bull snake could still had teeth and it could hurt you, but it sure. wouldn't kill you. And then eventually I worked my way up to rattlesnakes, you know. And then I started catching rattlesnakes. And I remember the first time I brought a rattlesnake home, I was maybe six, seven. Like I was just turning you seven. You probably that young. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, and I came in with it wrapped around my neck. Like I literally I had it around my neck and I walked in the house with it. And my mom was like, like, oh, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, you got to play with that outside. <laughs> I know you, and she realized like my mom, because she's also kind of like me. She, right. she, she didn't try to say don't do that because she knew all I would do is do it not near the house. She right. wanted me to, if I'm going to do that, she wanted it, me to be close. Close by, so yeah. Like, okay, just play with them outside. Don't bring them in the house. That was her thing, so. Un- unbelievable. So so you're six years old. You've yeah. been in, where, Nepal, India, Afghanistan. Yeah, I'd already when been around the world get... three times by the time I was seven. So these were, like, you were leaving for, you know, kind of months yes. at a time or yep. a year or whatever. And then, yep. so you come back home, and, and we're, we're – where were you living at the time? Um, I, I kind of, depending on the trips, uh, we lived in Palm Springs some of the times, Palm Springs, California, sure. but most of the time we were in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe, New Mexico is where my dad started a shop called Yazi Muhammad and Muldoon, and that's where they right. would sell most of their art they the would bring back. So between like 1 and 12, I would say 80% of my time in the United States was spent in there. So that's why I went to first through fifth grade was in Santa Fe. So most of my schooling was done there. And that's where I started learning about, um, like, bullying and and kids being super ultra mean. Talk to me about that. You spent a lot of time in that. And I think a lot of folks have, you know, kind of been been through that. But you had a really interesting way of telling the story. I love the story (laughs) when 
you kind of had enough. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I was fighting um, from first grade to fifth grade. I was in a fight almost every single day. Like, it was almost never. Unbelievable. I, I would show up, and I was always the new kid because I was traveling, and I always go to a new school. I was always – I also grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where – I was a minority, like being a white kid right. with blonde hair. I, I was right. different, just straight up. And I was, and I come from a group who, who was pretty hated. You know, it was mostly Native American and Hispanic children who hated me. I mean, that's just all right. there's to it because I was white, which, okay. I mean, now I'm older, so, fair enough. I get it. I mean, yep. there's a reason yeah. why they hated me. <laughs> right. I, it wasn't, but as a there's kid, some you, reasons. Don't have, you don't understand. Yeah. You're just, right. people don't like you and you don't know why. And, and I was also weird on top of all of it. Like, I was also right. a strange kid because I'd been traveling around the world. So my I was different. I didn't yeah. – I wasn't like – totally, totally different things others had never seen. Jeez, exactly. Who you are. And, and, yeah. and, and kids, I've noticed, have a tendency to like things to conform. They want things right. to be in this kind of box, you know. And if you're a round peg – they try their best to pound you into a square hole. I mean, that's what kids yeah. do. And that's, and there's the very clicky, like there's these little like tribes of children, you know, and I was never part of any of the tribes. I wasn't one of the little jocks. I didn't play the little right. sports. I wasn't one of the like, you know, nerds. I wasn't, I didn't fit into any of the categories of what any of these kids were. So I was always um, an outcast. I was always like ostracized. Right. And for some reason, I was always the target. Like they wanted to beat me up. And it was, and I was big though. I was kind of a bigger kid. So right. they never came at me one on one. It was never me against one person. It was always me against like five, six, ten. So it was an unfair fight. Always unfair title. fight. Never <laughs> yeah. fair, ever, ever. Yeah. But what I was, was I understood <clears throat> fear. And I started right. becoming very scary because I started realizing, you know, you can't beat 10 people unless right. you are terrifying. You have to become right. so scary that these people don't want to come anywhere near you. And right. I started becoming more and more frightening. And by fifth grade, I finally had just had enough. And I was ready to just explode. Like it was, I had become an incredibly unstable, very mm -hmm. violent, very angry child. And, and honestly, if I were to meet um, a fifth grader like myself, I would be very scared of them. Like they right. would, they would scare me because I was on the edge of doing something very horrible. Like I, really there was bad. no question. I was yeah. on the edge of just completely like breaking psychologically. And I had these five kids gang up on me and just beat the shit out of me for no reason. I mean, I just right. was there and they decided to do this right. and it just flicked a switch in me that, that I was over it. I'm like, this is the last time this happens. I'm done. So right. I went inside the school and look for a weapon. I'm just like, I, what, what can I hurt this person with? I want to find like the biggest scare. Right. I want to hurt this person. What, what can I hurt them with? I right. found a pencil sharpener that was shaped in a, a jagged, scary thing. And at my school, they, there was first through sixth grade and they would line up kids. So all the kids would line up in these lines to pay based on your grade. And he was in sixth grade. I was in fifth grade. And he was standing right next to the teacher because he knew I was coming for him. Like he knew right. he could tell. Like, I told him <laughs> I was coming for him. So he knew. So he was standing next to the teacher thinking that he's not going to do anything to me when I'm next to the teacher. But he didn't realize how angry I was. So right. I literally just walked straight to him, looked him right in the eye, grabbed it, and I just cracked his skull open with the big pencil sharpener thing that was in my hand. I just dropped him right there, right in front of the teacher, looked her right in the eye, and I'm just like, I'm done. And she's just like, like, she didn't know what to do. Like, there was like, it was just so violent and so much rage and so much just like, and I turned around walked into the school, went to the principal's office. No one even told me to go there. I just went. Right. I sat down in front of the principal, and she's just like, oh, hey, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, I just cracked a kid's head open with a pencil sharpener. Right. If another person touches me, I'm going to kill them. And she's just like, and, and I just said, so it. matter of fact, just, and there was no question in her, in her mind that yeah. I was going to do exactly what I said I was going to do. Like, there was no, it's like, I'm not threatening. I'm not, it, it, this is just what's going to like you yeah that's you know not, what's so funny man I, I always said like and i think some of the folks you know operate at all in the middle east when you, if you get threatened over there yeah. it's not a threat like we no. we puff our chest out we fuck no, around no, no. like come on bro we're gonna smoke you no we're gonna do it no no this is they're just telling you what's gonna happen this is scarier. you can't even call it a threat you can't call yeah. it a threat it is this is yeah. what's going to happen right yeah. now and that was where my life changed a lot because um the school took me very seriously, which is a right. good thing. I'm glad right. they did. I feel like I, I feel like it was a different time 
because the school um, contacted my parents. My parents came in. They brought in psychologists. They brought in three different psychologists from all over the country to kind of study wow. my brain because it was that's how violent it was. That's how aggressive I was. That's how angry I was. And they realized very quickly, they're like, yes, um, Jeb is different. Like, this is elevating. And this is right. going to escalate and it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse. And if someone's going to get hurt, like if right. he goes to high school, someone's going to get hurt and we can't, this is a bad idea. So I was put into homeschooling. They separated me from kids, which is a fascinating thing because it worked. That's it what's worked. so strange. It worked. Uh, the second I was separated from other children, because that's what it was. I didn't like kids. I didn't right. like how mean they were. I didn't like, how, I mean, I didn't go to school to learn. I was going to school. So it was, it was literally a war zone for me. I felt like I was going to combat. So I was wired for combat. Like when I went right. to school, it was, I was all, I was just ready at any moment right. to have to like fight and like defend myself from like multiple assailants every day, all the time. And it turned me into a monster. But the second I was put into homeschooling, all of that rage just I didn't, dude, I haven't been in a fight since fifth grade. I mean, think That's about that for a second. Unbelievable. Not, not a single fight since fifth grade. So the second I was pulled out of the situation, um, it kind of went away, the rage, in a way. I think it became kind of submerged, but sure. it, it just, I didn't have anything to like get pissed off at or attack or, or have to defend myself against. So right. um, life changed for me at that moment. But then I became very isolated and I became very alone. And, and that's, that's also challenging, right? So now from fifth grade to 12th grade, I had no friends. I didn't hang out with anyone my own age ever. Not just because, you know, my parents were kind of trying to, I didn't want to be around people my own age. I, got, right. I had zero desire. I hated kids. I didn't want to be around kids. I didn't like people. I was very, I became very um, um, antisocial. I guess that's the only way to describe yeah. I was very antisocial. I didn't want to be around people. And I was broken mentally. Like psychologically, I became a very broken person. And by 16, I became super suicidal. Like depression, I don't even know if depression's a strong enough word to describe it. I was gonna what, kill myself. Like, what do you think no pushed it that way? Do you think it was, I mean, obviously when you're picked on every day, there's no question of getting beat up that you're gonna get super hardened and scary because it's yeah. either gonna be that or you're you're gonna be a victim. Uh, yeah, exactly. And nonstop. Yeah, no and that, but then you go right into essentially mental isolation, which is- yeah. Because I had to. I mean, brutal, for, for, yeah. For, again, protection, right? It's, it's, right? And then I was in, uh, the only people I spoke to between you know, that, age were my parents that's it there was no one else i talked to my sisters and my parents there was really nobody else you know and i became very to call myself i was a living dead person i guess that's the only way right. i can describe it by 16 i no longer really wanted anything i right. didn't have any passions or desires i didn't care i actually didn't even want to wake up in the mornings like i would wake up and you'd always be like Again, like, wow. and, and you get this weird, it, it's very important in life to have a desire. You have right. to want something. There has to be a reason to be here. Like, why do you drink water and eat food and breathe oxygen? Why do you exist? You have to have an, you have to be able to answer that question for yourself. There has to be yeah. a reason to be here. Otherwise, what you're just taking up space, right? And I was just taking yeah. up space and, and psychologically I was done. I was suffering. I was in wow. pain. And I didn't want to be here anymore. And, and, and it got really extreme. And I was going to kill myself. Like, it was 100% guarantee. There was no question it was happening. And that is brutal. One day, I was sitting on the couch, and I was just watching, you know, endless television channels, whatever. And all of a sudden, I, I click on this, this channel, and there's a guy standing on the edge of a cliff. Right. And I was watching him, and I'm just like, huh, what's that? You know? And all of a sudden I saw him step off the cliff and he opened his arms and started flying. He went into a base jump. And so it's a normal base. Well, not no, it's normal, but a base jump. A base jump. Suit. But yeah. no, no wings. They wingsuits didn't exist at the time. There was no such oh, thing. They didn't. Okay. This yeah. was pre wingsuit flying. So this was just base jumping. And I, but I, the first time I'd seen it, you know, and I, and I was just like, instantly it was like, I, I got struck by lightning. Like I felt like literal energy, like running through my body. And I'm like instantly like, Oh my God, that is incredible. Like that is, right. I, and, and instantly I'm like, that is what I'm going to do. Period. 
I'm going to do right. that. I'm going to do whatever it takes to do that until the day I die. That's it. That's what I'm doing. Right. And it's a fascinating thing because it created a, a shift in the way my brain worked. It's, it's hard to describe. And, and, and depression is a funny thing. It doesn't just go away. It's not like, a right. person, oh, I'm a happy person now. It's not like that. Right. right. But what it did do is it created something I wanted. Right. It created right. a desire. It created somewhere I wanted to go, something I wanted to be. So anytime I would get into these really super dark, depressive states where you, you know, you're going to end your life, you know, you're going right. to stop your, and I was, I'd been there with guns in my mouth. I was going to pull right. the trigger. You were, you were I was going to kill myself right there. for sure. And, and the thing that kept me from pulling the trigger, the thing that kept me from doing it was I'm not going to waste it. You know, I'm, if I'm going to die anyway, I want to do something special with my death. I want to do something right. that other people are too afraid to do because they're too afraid to die. I, I'm going to do right. things that others are not willing to do. And right. what it did is it helped me put the gun down and just hang on just a little bit longer. So in wow. a weird way, base jumping ended up saving my life because it helped me it helped me hang on during a super dark period. Now, that period is not unique to me. Lots sure. of teenagers go through this. And whether it's hormonal or or just isolation or being bullied or whatever you it's want real. to call it. It's real. It's real and it's a lot of yeah. people do. A lot and so I know I'm not unique. So sure. but what I did do and I I is I found something that was so powerful and so big that I that I really wanted and it made me hang on. And then through the process of getting there, something strange happened. I became happy. It was weird. Like becoming 18, learning to skydive, meeting other skydivers, learning sure. that there's other people in the world who kind of think like I do, that I'm not actually alone, that there are other people like me. I started like speaking to people, getting to know people. I got a job. You know, I started like right. working and I started like realizing, I started becoming very happy. And I'd say by the time I was 19, I was no longer suicidal. I was actually quite, really? oh, very, very happy, actually. So unconventional escape path, but incredibly effective. You know, it's funny. You say the word desire and like, I, you read books about POWs that have, you know, getting tortured and beat yeah. up or someone that's been injured. And I always said, you know what all humans need is something to look forward to. And as soon as you don't have something to look forward to, you're going to be depressed. It's not really working. fast. You're done. And it sounds like you found a desire or something to look yeah. forward to. And this is the story I love so much because it's a story of fighting through adversity yeah. and finding a purpose. Something to look forward to, a way, a place to belong. Yep. Now you're accepted. Yep. And now, purpose. now the important part is going all in. <laughs> well, this is the thing, right? Yeah. Purpose, I think, is you, you nailed it on the head. Purpose is the number one single most important thing in a person's life. Right. A lot of people think it's happiness or it's joy. No, those things are byproducts of having purpose, something that means something to you, something that matters to you. And it's different for everybody. You know, what, what my purpose is, isn't going to be the same thing that's your purpose or somebody else's. And that's really the key to all of this is finding something that becomes your purpose. So your reason for living, your reason for eating and drinking and breathing and existing. And once right. you find that, you then, that's where the courage comes in, right? Courage comes in because it's scary, right? Whatever your purpose is, I don't care if it's going to be becoming a CEO of a company, starting your own business, dumping, like borrowing money from your family so you can start this business. And like, oh my right. God, I, I could literally implode everyone right now. That's terrifying, yeah. right? Yeah. But having the courage to be able to work through that fear, and that, that so that you can get to what your purpose is, oh my God, right. that's everything. The courage that's what to it's pursue all about. your purpose. Courage yeah. to pursue your purpose. And for me, I, I, it, it became a real kind of um, paradox once I started base jumping. So I, I wanted to start base jumping when I was 16, right? I saw base jumping as this just like perfect thing because if I succeeded, then I did something that no one else in this world was willing to do right. or very few people were. Oh, and if I didn't succeed, well, then I got released from my suffering on this planet. So for me at 16, it was a perfect activity. There was a win-win situation. I couldn't lose. But by the time I finally got to base jumping, which was 21, was when I did my first base jump. You were jump. 21 on your first 
first base jump to win. So it took five years to get there. And I started skydiving at 18. It took me three years because I didn't have that much money. So what I would do, I worked a job. I was a projectionist in a movie theater. So I okay. save up my money, go do a jump, save up my money, go do a jump. It took me three years to, to and with that little money, build up enough to be able to get enough jumps to get to where I could start. Basically. You didn't quit. No, I just did because that's, that's all there was. That's the only reason. You made it happen. That was my, the fact that I saw that as my only purpose, like that's my reason for living. That right. was what, that's what made, there was no giving up wasn't even an option. To give up yeah, was to die. No plan B. There what was the, no plan. You know what's wild? Some of the craziest overachievers in this world almost all said, I didn't have a plan B. No, it's focus. Yeah. It's focus. You focus, you, you, that, that focus, this is, you know, what's really strange when you're absolutely dead focused on one thing, you put all of yourself into that one thing. And when you put all of yourself into one thing, you're going to get good at that yeah. one thing, period. You, you, yeah. The hours and hours that you just spend focusing, thinking, dreaming, doing, like just that hyper laser focus is what makes people exceptional at whatever it is that they want to do. And when you become exceptional at something, people will pay you to do it. It doesn't make any difference what it is. I, I don't care if right. you're a teacher, a singer, an actor, if you work in the military, pick a thing. Pick whatever you want, right? Taking care of kids. That If you're really exceptionally good at taking care of children, people will pay you to do it, right? Nice. I became exceptional at jumping off buildings. That You don't <laughs> make money like that. That's not how anyone makes money. And yet somehow... I've been making well, a living from base jumping for 25 years now, you know, and, and it's because I, I was so hyper focused on it and it became everything to me. It's all I wanted to do. So I put everything I had and I actually eventually got pretty good at it. And then once you get good at it, dude, I, tr I turned something that you couldn't make money. Like there was no way to make money when I started, right? That wasn't right. how you made money. And I figured out how to make money from something that people didn't pay for, you know, that's because so, you got really good at it and you didn't, you had no plan B, you didn't quit and you went yeah. all in. You know, when I was reading your book, um, the, a couple of things on the technical side, you know, I've talked to my buddies. I hate the feeling of negative G's. I yeah. hate that freaking fit. If I'm piloting it, it's fine. Like I drove a dragster, whatever. If I drove it, someone yeah. else drove it. My stomach was like going through my, you know, my brain yeah. or out my ass or something like that. Yeah. The thing I didn't understand was like, when you jump out of a plane, I guess you're moving. And so you have yeah. wind resistance that helps, yep. that can either tumble you or help you get stable if you yep. can fly right. What I didn't understand reading your book, and it makes total sense, but when you jump from a static object- You accelerate. You're, you're totally out of control right away. Yep. And, yep. and talk to you about how you learned that. And I'd love to hear about the first jump in the book. I mean, Matt, I'd love to read the section, but it'll probably take too long. But when you talk about climbing that antenna for the first oh, yeah. time, Holy yeah. shit, man. Yeah, that, that story is not That one made my heart thump reading. Well, it, it's it's funny because to this day, it's still the most terrifying jump I've ever done. And really? And sixth base jump. And it's funny because a lot of people think it was your first. Um, but my first actually didn't really have that big of an impact on me. It, right. it was this one because this was the first real dangerous one. But to, to answer your question, it's a big question. You know, I covered like multiple chapters cover it. But yeah. um, the... The learning to control your body's position when jumping into dead air, like going from zero to 60 in like around three seconds, uh, that comes from, first you gotta have a lot of skydiving training so that you okay. know what to do with your body when you reach terminal velocity. So, so you can maybe figure out how to get off and fall flat, but then once you reach terminal, you're gonna start losing control. So you right. need to have control once you're reaching terminal. So that comes from like doing hundreds and hundreds of skydives. Like that's it. The beginning of anyone who wants to do this, you have to learn to skydive. There's no way around it. That's, that's what you need to do. And you need to do hundreds of skydives, right? And actually, right. honestly, you should do thousands. Like if you really want a, a real chance of success, like long-term survival, you really should do thousands of skydives before you even think about base jumping. How many did you do? Oh uh, yeah. See, that's the thing. I was an, I was a mentally deficient person at the time. So I, I only did 150, <laughs> which isn't enough. I, I, Get I, some. It's not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. I should have done a lot more skydives, but I was right. impatient and I didn't care about skydiving. I actually, to be honest with you, didn't like skydiving. Like skydiving to me was a barrier between me and base jumping. Like, what I just, was it? I don't know. Fun it's, enough? Was it? I just, just didn't care about it. it. It didn't matter to me. It's just not something I wanted to do. I wanted to base jump. And, and a lot of people I see 
with that mentality that I had there, you know, when you're young, you're impatient, you know, and I just wanted to oh, get yeah. into base jumping. I just want to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. I want to jump off the Eiffel Tower. I want to go jump off these structures. I had these dreams that I've been dreaming about for five years, and it's all I wanted to do. And the mm -hmm. skydiving to me was just this barrier, and it was expensive. So it was hard for me to get the jumps I needed because I didn't sure, have yeah, the need money. A plane. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have the money. So I was kind of like, ah, it's just in my way. And that's how I saw it. I mean, I like skydiving now. It took probably around, I don't know, a couple hundred skydives more. Like I needed like five, 600 skydives before I started enjoying it. Now I see skydiving as a fun thing to do with my friends, my fiance. Like it's fun to do sure. with buddies and stuff. I, it's not like hardcore or extreme. It's, it's like, it's kind of like going scuba diving. It's, it's fun. It's like just a fun thing you do, you know, but it's not like, you're not like jumping out and like getting like some rush or anything. I'm in the airplane kind of like, like, you know, then you jump out of the airplane, like doo -doo -doo -doo, we're flying around you open your parachute land. I think it's scary shit. I mean, yeah, well, <laughs> like, like anything, dude, that's how fear is, right? It starts yeah. like that. But after yeah. you do a few hundred skydives at, at sure. a thousand skydives, you it, dude, it'd be just like walking across the street. Like it's not, it's, it, it gets any like anything in life you become desensitized to it right once you understand it better and you know most fear comes from not knowing you don't yeah. really know what's going to happen you don't understand the equipment you don't understand the gear so it scares you because you're not sure if it's going to work or not but after you do a thousand jumps you realize oh this stuff works you know yeah. <laughs> it, it's been designed over decades and decades and decades and this stuff works and and you and you start realizing what causes malfunctions and what you know you you, you avoid those things and Sure. And you know what you're doing. And the more you know, the more confidence you become in whatever it is that you're doing. And then with that confidence, fear kind of melts away, right? Yeah. Now, I think a lot of people get that in public speaking, no? They, they I mean, do. Um, yeah. I, I'm fortunate because I love to talk, so I've never had a problem with public speaking. Yeah, you're good. I, I enjoy you're good. it. But, yeah. but yes, yeah, some people, again, but everyone's different, right? So some yeah. people, that's the number one fear of most people is yeah. public speaking, right? Yeah. But like you just said, if you do little like speeches for like 10 people, you know, you start small and then mm -hmm. you slowly build yourself up. I always, I always equate overcoming fear to working out, right? So imagine you go into a gym and your goal is to lift 200 pounds over your head, right? right. If you walk into that gym first day and try to lift 200 pounds over your head, you're going to get hurt. You can't yep. do it. You, there's no way you're going to be able to lift it. You don't have the muscle isn't strong enough. So what you start with is 10 pounds. You lift 10 pounds. And then over time, okay, now you can lift 20, 30, 40, 50. It's straight, it's literal math. It's like one plus one equals two. You lift this weight enough times, your muscle right. gets stronger, you can lift the next level. And then you lift that weight, you mix, and, and it's the exact same thing with fear. You don't just start doing a double reverse flip off the center of the Eiffel Tower in a base jump. <laughs> You're gonna die, right? You start with a tandem skydive like everyone else. You go right. do your hundreds of skydives. You then start base jumping off low bridges. Then you start jumping off of high stuff, like big cliffs with nice landing areas. Then you can take it once you get through that. Then you can start doing buildings. Then you can do it. So it's like there's this this like kind of um, way to, to desensitize yourself to fear and horror. But now I have to be honest because with most things in life, it works like that. Like when I started riding motorcycles, you're kind of like, oh, that's kind of dangerous. Then you start doing it like, you know what, with the right training, right preparation, you don't fuck around yeah. too much. It's actually not that bad. This is how um, I ride. Remember the first time you're like, you're doing 80 miles an hour and the wind's hitting you. It's like, damn, oh, yeah. this feels exposed and fast. Oh, yeah. And then somebody <laughs> cuts you off and almost makes you yeah. crash. And you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Right? It's, it's yeah. it, you know. So it's, but the truth is, is that you can get to a place where you're comfortable with it. Right? Same thing with big wave surfing. Same thing with climbing, skydiving, diving with sharks. You know, I started diving with sharks thinking it was super scary. Then you realize, oh, you know what? With the right training, right preparation, you do it the right way. It's actually not that bad. Base jumping is the first thing I've ever gotten into where I thought it was dangerous. You know, I thought I understood, like, what I was getting myself into. Um, and after about a decade of doing it, I realized this is so much more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. This is wow. way more terrifying. I'm more scared of base jumping now than I was when I started. It is. Isn't that funny? Oh, it's horrible. Because you know it can go wrong. <laughs> no, you see it. You can't fool yourself anymore. Yeah. Now you yeah. know you've watched people die. You've right. been injured. You've spent months in the hospital. You've had to learn to walk again. You've broken your back. You've been eaten by animals. Horrible things have happened to you. You've been covered in human blood. I mean, at a certain point, you're just like, yeah. oh, my God. This is not only every bit as gnarly as I thought it was. This is gnarlier than I could have ever imagined. And, and my experience in the sport has been nothing short of just, it's unbelievable. If you had told me when I started that I would have experienced the things that I've experienced, I, I wouldn't believe you. I couldn't believe you. It's unbelievable. And, and right. my book 
if I hadn't lived it, like if I hadn't gone through it, if I didn't have video to prove it, I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't believe it myself. I think I hallucinated it, right? Because it's, <laughs> it's absolutely mind boggling. It but you seem- couldn't make this shit up either, man. When I read this, it's pretty, not many books you can read 300 some pages or 180,000 <laughs> words in, in an evening, <laughs> you know, and it was, it was that unbelievable, but totally believable. Because well, I, of the I, level of detail and depth. Well, I tried all my best also to um, do stories <clears throat> where there's video. So that's one thing about my book oh, as well, smart. is you can actually go online and watch the footage from right. almost every single story I tell. So you can see it, right? right? You can actually see that, oh, no, not only did this guy do exactly what he said he did, it's 10 times gnarlier. Like, it's yeah. way worse than what you think. Like, I write it as honest. And that was another thing. I tried my best to just be honest. Because yeah. when you're honest and you just write how you remember it, and I know that my memory is not perfect. No one's is. You know, there's obviously going to be flaws. And some people who are there are going to see it different. Because that's how memory works, right? Yeah. But I did my best to try to make it as as true to what I could remember as I possibly could. And I and I wanted I, – I, I'm not a hero in my book. Like, you don't read my book and think, oh, this guy's – no, no. I am a flawed person who's broken, who's trying to cope with – a, a serious mental disorder. And I, right. I didn't even realize I had one. Like I was just kind of living my life. I lived in two week increments. Like there was mm-hmm. no past. I never looked back. All I was, was in this moment and what's going to happen in two weeks from now. And I lived in two week increments for 30 years. I mean, almost 30 years of my life for two week increments. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> when I started writing this book, it forced me to go back and look at these things. And, and then I had to, when you're writing about them, you have to try to explain, like, why. And I started noticing a trend where I just didn't have any explanation. I didn't understand why. I'm like, why would I do that? Like, what was going on? And then all of a sudden, I came to a really strange realization about myself that it, it's funny because we always joke around, oh, you're crazy. I'm crazy. You know, oh, we're crazy. Yeah. But no, I realized, no, I am actually crazy. Like, there's an actual serious psychological (laughs) problem inside my head. And and I'm like, that's the only explanation is I was suffering from some type of psychosis that I was trying to cope with. And and I feel like I was very fortunate because a lot of people, I think, are dealing with psychosis, especially now. There's something. a huge amount. Everybody. Everyone has some type of mental of struggle that they're going through. And I felt really, um, I don't know, i happy looking back now I can say happy. I'm happy about the fact that I chose something like base jumping instead of becoming an alcoholic or taking a bunch of drugs or getting into opioids or, or like, right. I, I don't drink or smoke or use drugs of any kind. And I, I decided to use extreme experience to deal with these demons that were ripping me apart from the inside. I had right. serious um, issues um, within myself that were trying to kill me. Like I, I was literally internally trying to implode. And it was a real struggle to not let the demons rip me down and just drag me to earth and just end me. And then these extreme experiences, like putting myself into true terror and true horror and true fear, not like right. made up. No, no, this is scary. Like, I'll tell you about the antenna. Like you, you asked the question. Yeah, like, I, that was and a I think fascinating. The, I think read. the antenna jump is one of my more important um, experiences because I had wanted to be a base jumper for you know at that point. I think I'd already been jumping. I'd been base jumping for like a little less than a year. Um, it had been five years to get to this place. I jumped off the bridge in Auburn as my first jumps, but I didn't really feel much from them. They didn't feel like real base jumps. They felt too safe. I didn't feel Mm -hmm. that scared. I was just landing a parachute on a road. It felt kind of not that different from skydiving, really. It was scarier, but not not too bad. It didn't feel like I grew from them, right? Right. Um, This antenna was a 300-foot antenna that was (laughs) on the grade um, next to Camarillo. It was on a hill, and it was surrounded by cactus. And I had a girlfriend that lived out in that area at the time. And I would see it driving by all the time. And when I would see it, I'm like, man, I wonder if that's high enough to jump off, right? But it looked really tiny. I'm like, ah, nah, it's like maybe 70 feet tall. Like, there's no way that thing's right. tall enough. It only had two lights, one in the middle, one on top. It was this little rinkety looking thing on top of the hill. And I didn't believe it could be jumped. I'm like, yeah, it's not possible. Anyways, I had a friend who was a pilot. 
And he started telling me about these things called aeronautical charts. And on these aeronautical charts, it shows every man-made structure oh. and how tall they are. It shows the exact altitudes because pilots need to know how yeah. high things are so they don't run into them. So I'm like, oh, really? I'm all, could you get me an aeronautical chart for the Camarillo area? And he's like, sure, no problem. So he bought me one, gave it to me as a gift. And I instantly go and look at that antenna. And on the chart, it has the antenna and it was 300 feet tall. And I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, there's no way that thing's 300 That's feet tall. tall. It's super, well, for me, I was like, oh, I can base jump that. Like instantly in my head, it's yeah. like, I'm going to jump off that. So, but I didn't believe it. I thought maybe it was 300 feet from the bottom of the hill. Like I'm all, they can't be, it's because it just visually didn't look like it was that tall. I was too young in the sport. I just didn't know how to like judge altitudes very well. So I decided I'm going to go check it out. So I got an aeronautical watch, like a, a Alti watch that would show altitude in five foot increments. I got a range finder so I could like, so basically I'm like, okay, I'll have three things. If all three of them say it's 300 feet, I'm going for it, right? So I climbed this thing in the middle of the night, get up to the top. It's like really cold. It was like, a, like just in the spring, but it was like a cold night. So everything was like really quiet. And I went up there and I got to the top and I did my range finder and it said 300 feet. And I looked at my Alti watch. It said like 302 feet or something. And I was just like, oh, it's 305 feet. And I was like, oh, okay. It's 300 feet. But I look down, I'm like, God, this does not look like 300 feet. This looks really low, right? But I'm like, oh, no, I can't jump from here because there's all this, like, antenna stuff. So I went underneath oh. the antenna stuff, and it was at about 260 feet was where I could actually jump from. So now, it look, didn't look high enough by the antennas. No. <laughs> it, didn't, it, didn't, dude, it, it, it looked so <laughs> tiny. And it was. It was really low. And it was one of, and it's not a freestanding antenna either. There's different types of antennas. This was an okay. antenna that had guy wire. So it's an antenna that comes up and has guy wires that come off. So if you jump oh. off and you get oh, off in the opening, you'll go into guy wires. So it's a terrible object to jump. You should never base jump an object that's that little with guy wires because your chances of having a, uh, an accident are, are highly increased. But I didn't know that. I, at the time, I didn't know enough. I didn't know what I didn't know, basically. Right. So I called my, my jump. I got home, and I was, like, super excited because here's this antenna. It's 260 feet. When I'd gone through my base jumping course – I was told never to jump below 300 feet without a static line, right? I'd never used a static line. I didn't know how static lines work. And that pulls your pilot out right They're away? How do those work? It's, it's attached to your bridle that attaches to your parachute. And there's oh, okay. a piece of 100-pound um, brake cord that's attached to that. So as you jump off the object, it actually pulls your parachute out for you. And then, okay. and then with the brake cord snap. Just like a body. static line jump in the military. Yeah, and it, it, exactly. And it, it's fast. Yeah. Like, so static line jumps basically open your parachute very quickly. It's for jumping from very low objects. And um, it just ensures you've got a canopy over your head before hitting the ground, right? right. You don't, if you throw a pilot chute, like you have a pilot chute, you have to build up enough speed for the pilot chute to work to be able to pull, oh, to pull your, it to out. extract your parachute. So you fall much further. So okay. anyways, they yeah. said, I was told, don't free fall below 300 feet. I mean, that was the kind of rule for someone with zero base jumps who's just like learning whatever. So I call my instructor and I'm just like, hey, I found this 300 foot antenna. And my instructor's instantly like, all they say is don't jump it. <laughs> don't jump that. I'm like, no, no, I wasn't calling about that. I have a question. And they're like, they're like, Jeb, don't jump it. I'm telling you, you're not ready. Don't do it. They're all, is it freestanding or does it have guy wires? I'm like, it's got guy wires. It's like, oh, don't jump it. Like, really don't jump that. They're like, they're like you don't know enough yet. But when you get more experience, you're going to realize it's just a bad jump. Like, you're, it's right. really, really dangerous. Don't do that. And I'm like, well, that wasn't my question. My question was, if I use a 48-inch pilot chute, how long will it take my parachute to open? And they're just like, Jeb, don't jump it. And I'm like, how long? They're like, it'll probably take your parachute around 150 feet. And I was like, perfect. Thank you. And I hung up the phone. I'm like, perfect. That means I've got about what? It's at 50. I'll have around. I don't know, 110 feet for, for landing. Perfect. No problem. So I decided I was going to jump it. Right. Anyways, oh I, uh, <laughs> I call one of my buddies who, uh, he's actually the one who went up with me to Auburn for my very first base jump. And I'm like, Hey dude, I'm going to go jump this, you know, 260 foot antenna. It's on Camarillo. And I, he, I, he'd kind of seen it a few times because I'd been pointing it out to him. And I'm like, I, I need a, I need someone to come do ground crew in case I get hurt. And he's just like, uh, no way. He's like, there's you no, do it. you're on your own. And he's like, dude, if you do that, you're on your own. He's like, I am not going to be there and watch you kill yourself. I'm sorry. I'm just not, it's not happening. He's like, if you're going to do that, you're doing that by yourself. And I'm just like, I'm like, all right, whatever. You know, so I hung up on him and I'm just like, I guess I'm doing this one on my own. Like that's it. It's just me. Right. And I wait a couple weeks and it like warms up. It's like a, like a warmer time. And, uh, <laughs> 
I get my gear and I start going out to my car. And at that time I was living in the guest house of my parents. And my mom sees me with my base rig and she like runs out. And she's like, hey, what are you doing? Like, where are you going with that? And I'm like, oh, I found this 260 foot antenna. I'm going to go jump it to Camarillo. And she's like, uh, no, you're not. Because she, you know, during my whole training, during the whole process, I'd right. been talking to her a lot. So she actually was a little educated on, on what this is. She knew and, it was a dangerous job. she just knew, Jeb, dude, you're not, yeah. that's not, that's not good. That's too low. Like, you're too new. She's like, you, you should train more. Like, just do more practicing. Like, that just sounds really dangerous. And I'm like, I'm sorry, mom, but I, I you know, I, I got to do this. And, and this is a really interesting thing because my mom had never told me not to do anything my entire life. She was always very supportive of everything. But this was the first and only time she ever said, Jeb, you cannot do that. And if you do, you're going to have to find another place to live because I will not support bad decision making like this. Wow. And I'm just like, well, like reckless, yeah. You're reckless. She just thought it was super reckless. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, mom, you're going to do what you have to do and I'm going to do what I have to do. And I just got in my car and drove away. And I'm like, I'm I'm jumping this thing. There's I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what anyone does. I'm I'm doing this. And I drove out to the antenna and I'm completely by myself. Uh, I wait until around like midnight, so it's pitch black. And it was also new moon, so it was like dark, dark, right. like super dark. And I basically parked my car at the, there's like this hill with like a little fence that kind of locked it off so people wouldn't drive up there. And I parked the car and I start walking up the hill. And as I start walking up the hill, I start like getting really scared. Like it, it, it's kind of hard to describe it, but I kind of felt like my heart like rising up in my chest into my throat. And I could feel like, like literally pumping like here. Yeah. We were just like sweating like profusely. And I remember That's just extreme fear. Oh, I, I started shaking. Like I could feel my body like shaking. And all of a sudden I hear this sound like kind of off in the distance. And as I get closer to it, I just hear it erupt and it's just, it's a rattlesnake. And I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. I'm like, <laughs> is that your primal side of you or is that the base jump? <laughs> I caught rattlesnakes as a kid. So I understood right. rattlesnakes. And the last oh, okay. thing you want to do is be in the dark. You know, yeah. and startle rattlesnake because it's gonna bite you, right? That guy yeah. knew about this, so I'm like, oh shit! So I grab a, I like start looking at, like feeling on the ground for a stick, right? And I'm like, oh shit! I need something to like push out in front of me. So I kind of get a stick. I find one that's long enough, and I'm kind of like, okay. So I start walking with this stick out in front of me because I can't see shit. Like I can't see them, but I can hear. Them. <laughs> so then I, I kind of get to where that snake is, and I'm kind of like, you know, making sure like get the fuck away from me, kind of thing. And as I go, all of a sudden I hear another one. And then another one. And then, and then they just start like a, a chain reaction where it's just like, and I'm like, holy, there's hundreds of them. And as I'm walking up this hill, I'm just like going, holy shit. That just made this a thousand times more terrifying. I'm mean, <laughs> literally going to be jumping off of this antenna landing, landing in the rattlesnakes. <laughs> and the hill is, is all cactus. So it's all cactus rattlesnakes. And there's just this one road. So if I jump off and I miss that road, I'm landing in cactus and rattlesnakes. So I'm just like, oh my God, this is insane. Like, this is insane. So I keep walking, keep walking, freaking rattlesnakes everywhere. And I'm like, my God, like it must have been like spring just hit and they just all came out because I was like, oh my God, there's so many. And I get to the fence and it's a chain link fence and I climb over it and there's like razor wire and whatever, but I get over the fence and for some reason I felt better. I'm like, okay, I'm in here. Right. I'm getting my protective for Alex. It's a chain link fence that can go right through it. Like this, I don't <laughs> feel like this was better totally to be inside this fence. Like somehow that's going to keep the snakes out. But I was just like terrified. And all of a sudden I was like, holy shit. And I get out my gear and I start putting it on. And all of a sudden my brain just starts going into this like mantra of like, do not do this. You are not ready. You right. need to train more. You need to get better. This is insane. You're being stupid as I grab onto the ladder and I start climbing. And every step I take, this mantra is just going, you're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. You're just going to go up there and take a look, but you're going to come back down. This is stupid. You're probably not going to die, but you're going to get seriously injured and there's no one here to help you. And, and this is just going through my head. I mean, literally every nerve ending in my body is screaming at me, stop, right. stop, stop. And I just keep going. I just keep going. And then all of a sudden I get to like the 260 foot mark 
I get inside and I kind of, it's it, the antennas are built like a triangle with pipes, okay. right? And right. I'm sitting my butt on here with two feet on two pipes. And I'm in the middle of the antenna and I can look straight down. And like I'm looking down and I look over and I see the, the 101 freeway and all the cars just kind of going and it's completely dead still, not even a slight breath of air, nothing. I guess that's Stillness. good. <laughs> Went there. You couldn't jump without it, right? That had right. to be dead still, but it was dead still. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like going, I'm not doing this. Like, I'm not going to do this as I pull my pilot chute out. <laughs> and I basically start S folding my pilot chute in my hand, start getting it ready. And I'm just like, I'm not going to do this. And I kind of come out of the antenna and like, I'm looking down, I'm kind of hanging on to it. And I have my pilot chute in my hand. I'm like, I'm all, Jeb, do not do this as I push off. And oh I, remember, I remember pushing off and I remember letting go of my pilot chute. And as I let go of the pilot chute, everything just froze. Like literally time just went. <sighs> and as it froze, I remember just being suspended. And I remember just like looking down and all of a sudden it went from being pitch black. Like I couldn't see shit except that little red light. And like, right. I couldn't see anything. All of a sudden I could see, like I could see the ground. I could see the razor wire fence. I could see all the individual guy wires spanning out from the sides of me. And everything started moving in like ultra slow motion. Like all of a sudden I just see guy wires just slowly going by. And I remember I'm falling and I'm watching the red light. And all of a sudden I see the red light coming. And then all of a sudden it passes me. And as the red light passes me, my brain's like, oh shit, you just passed half the antenna. That's 150 feet. Your parachute and you're hasn't not, opened yet. You know what? I don't have a parachute. And all of a sudden I look down, and I see the razor wire fence just coming for me. And all of a sudden I'm just like, oh shit. And I remember just bringing my arms up and I put them over my face and I'm bracing for impact because I'm like, I'm going to hit the razor wire fence. And as I'm doing this, all of a sudden I hear, I, at the time I was using something called a Velcro rig. And okay. Velcro, I heard it go. Whoop. And as the Velcro ripped, all of a sudden my parachute just opened with the four. I mean, it felt like someone had put me against a brick wall and took a baseball bat and just hit me in the chest with it as hard as they could. Is and that I, because you weren't ready to, to no, kind of brace yourself you were doing this? And the parachute took longer to open. And when that happens, you build up so much speed and you go from oh. like 40 miles an hour to zero. So it's like a car accident almost. It's like boom. And you just That's get a lot of G's. super like a crazy hard opening. Like it just whacked the shit out of me. It was like, like right. bam! And, I, and it hit so hard. I look down and I don't have time to even get to toggles. I'm that low. I grab a rear riser, turn. And as I'm in a turn, I literally bounce off asphalt. I hit the asphalt, bounce, and I'm laying on the ground and I'm, sh I mean, my whole body's just vibrating and like I'm shaking. And I, it was like a near death experience kind of feeling. And I'm just like, and I remember, like, I could hear insects crawling in the grass around me. I oh, my God. The air touching my skin. And I remember just standing up and being like, I have never felt anything like it. it, it I felt like I was absolutely connected to the universe in which I live in a way that I cannot even come close to describing. I – and – all of a sudden, I remember just standing there and going, I'm a base jumper now. Up wow. to that point, I had wanted to be something. From 16 years old, I had wanted to become something. And at that exact moment, I became that something. That was it. That was the moment when I realized there is nothing in this world that will stop me from attaining my goal. Period. Not my friends abandoning me. Not my mother threatened, not my parents threatening to kick me out of my house. Right. I couldn't even, I wasn't even capable of stopping me. I realized that at that moment, when I set my mind to doing something, I was going to do that something, period, no matter what. Not the fear of death, not the fear of anything was ever going to stand between me and one of my goals. It was the single most important thing I have ever done in my life, period. And it changed the trajectory of everything for me. There were no cameras. No one was filming. There was no one there. This was 100% me coping and figuring out who I was as a human being. This was me testing myself to see how far I could go. And I realized uh -huh. I could go all the way. And from that moment, I have done things that are hard to comprehend 
because I have a switch inside of my mind that I'm able to flick when it matters. When something That's... means something, when something is important, when something has to happen, I'm able right. to just go click and then think... I do it. You think there was something like that? What's the gentleman's name? Is it Alex? Alex Holland who climbed? Yep. I would hate to have been the cameraman. <laughs> well, I think Honnold's different though. Like, yeah. I think his brain actually works differently. I think he may be a bit autistic. I think he even talks about being a bit autistic. And I think he doesn't necessarily experience fear the, the way same. you and I like, do. But right. this is what I, I am. I think I'm quite different than Alex just from watching. I mean, I don't know him personally, but just yeah, from what I've witnessed of his interviews and seeing him, you know, when he's in scary situations and most of the time after, like when he's done with a climb, you don't see an elation. You see a person who's kind of like, oh, yeah, that was kind of cool. That was fun. I did you know? it. <laughs> I did it. Yeah, I got it done. Nice. Yeah. You know, you don't actually see someone who's like, oh, my God. Ah, like, you don't see someone yeah. who's like, I just full, almost full died. Stoke. Yeah, well, it's not even stoke. It's, it's more of just this like, oh, my God, I just – had an experience that's like oh my right. god right yeah um i think that i am very similar to other people with my fear response i'm not like okay. a superhuman i don't have a different way of my brain doesn't work different i think i am like you and everyone else right. i think the difference is, is i've just accepted the fact that i'm going to die which i did at right. a very early age and because i accept the fact that death is coming for me and that there's nothing i can do to prevent it from happening that i am going to live my life first 